This presentation is the second half of 2 Nephi 26 through 30. In this presentation, we will consider chapters of 2 Nephi 28 through 30. So let's begin. 2 Nephi chapter 28. 28 verse 1, the phrase constrained me meant in 1830 the word constrained often confused with restrained meant in one sense to compel, to urge, to action. So when he feels I am constrained to do something, Nephi is saying I am compelled to do something, not restrained, but constrained, meaning I'm, I'm compelled to do something. The phrase, they must surely come to pass, meant the word of the Lord is sure and certain. It will come to pass. Whether the word is spoken by the Lord himself or by one of his servants, it is the same. 28 verse 2, the phrase, the book shall be of great worth. Nephi explains that the Book of Mormon will be of great worth unto those in the last days who open their minds to the truth, particularly to those descendants of Lehi who respond to the familiar spirit felt and heard in the message of the Restoration. 28 verse 3, the phrase churches are built up and not unto the Lord meant whether established for noble or ignoble causes, any church imitated by man rather than by the revelation initiated by man rather than by the revelation of God is without the power of salvation. Such organization cannot fully satisfy man's innate yearnings to worship and serve the true and living God. In verse 3, the phrase, I am the Lord's, means... Nephi hears the various churches boasting of being the Lord's church. Some people may sincerely believe that if they make an organization of believers with the creed and imitation of biblical doctrines and a corps of officers with biblical names or titles, they have a church of Christ. But that is a mistake. A church of Christ must be founded by divine authority. A number of American citizens could not go abroad and organize an embassy that would be recognized as such without authority from the government in Washington, no matter how honest and able they might be. Nor can any man or any number of men without authority from the Lord build a church which he will recognize as his. What the psalmist says of the material creation is applicable to the spiritual existence also. Here's Psalms 22, 24, verse 1 through 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it. The church that we may say is his only if he is the founder of it. No painter, no matter how much of an artist he is, can make a genuine Rembrandt. The prophecy, this prophecy, many claiming I am the Lord's church, was fulfilled with exactness in the early years of the 19th century. There wasn't a place where we lived, Joseph Smith wrote, an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. It commenced with the Methodists, but soon became general among all the sects in that region of country. Indeed, the whole district of country seemed affected by it, and great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, which created no small stir and division amongst the people, some crying low here and others low there. Some were contending for the Methodist faith, some for the Presbyterians, some for the Baptists. That is, upon inquiring about the plan of salvation, I found that there was a great clash in religious sentiment. If I went to one society, they referred me to one plan, and another to another, each one pointing to his own particular creed as the summum bonum of perfections. And so, isn't it interesting that Nephi is able to prophesy of these events that will happen to Joseph thousands of years before they happen. 28 verse 4, the phrase, they shall contend one with another. Joseph the seer wrote, continuing in his Joseph Smith history, notwithstanding the great love which the converts to these different faiths expressed at the time of their conversion, and the great zeal manifested by the respective clergy who were active in getting up and promoting this extraordinary scene of religious feeling in order to have everybody converted, as they pleased to call it, let them join what sect they pleased. 
Yet, when the converts began to file off, some to one party and some to another, it was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real. For a scene of great confusion and bad feeling ensued, priest contending against priest and convert against convert, so that all their good feelings, one for another, if they ever had any, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest about opinions. Again, the fulfillment of this prophecy of Nephi. The phrase in verse 4, they shall teach with their learning, meant this is a prophetic warning against the notion that one must be formally trained for the ministry, in which case the sophistries of men become the object of their trust rather than the quiet whisperings of the Spirit. When men or women begin to discuss the principles and doctrines associated with salvation, they must do so under the influence of the Holy Ghost in order for the words to have convincing power. Otherwise, there is no lasting learning, no communication of saving verities, and no commitment no com or conversion. The law of the teacher is set forth in modern revelation as follows. Verily I say unto you, he that is ordained of me and sent forth to preach the word of truth by the comforter, in the spirit of truth, that he preach it by the spirit of truth or some other way. And if he and if he by some other way, it is not of God. And again, he that receiveth the word of truth, that he receive it by the spirit of truth or some other way. If it be some other way, it is not of God. Therefore, why is it that you cannot understand and know that he that receiveth the word by the spirit of truth, receive it as it is preached by the spirit of truth? Wherefore, he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. See, that takes the gift of the Holy Ghost. And to order to have the gift of the Holy Ghost, you must have the true gospel down here with the true priesthood to bestow that gift. To preach something which is true, note it must be true by some other way, meaning by the power of human reason and intellect is to undertake a word work which is not of God. That is to say it does not have the ratifying, confirming power which always accompanies an inspired and heaven-sent utterance. It is not the way the Lord himself would have done it. Indeed, the word of the Master is both a command and a prophecy. And the Spirit shall be given unto you by the prayer of faith. And if you receive not the Spirit, ye shall not teach." Two ways you can take that you shall not teach. One, if you don't teach by the Spirit, you're just saying words and intellect, and that's maybe of little value, but not of saving value. Or, you shall not teach. If you're not having the Spirit, you have no business being up there teaching. The phrase, deny the Holy Ghost, meant it is not that such persons deny that there is a Holy Ghost, or that they deny that the Holy Ghost ministered in the meridian of time. Some will even acknowledge that the Holy Ghost continues to minister in modern times. Rather, they deny the Holy Ghost in the sense that they reject the restored gospel and thus do not allow themselves access to the spiritual influence or power, spirit's influence or power. They teach with their own learning and thereby do not enjoy the powerful but peaceful spiritual accompaniment that could be theirs. As Nephi would soon explain, the Holy Ghost will give us utterance and will teach us all things that we should do and say if we seek the Lord in faithfulness. Chapter 28, verse 5, the phrase, They deny the power of God, the Holy One of Israel, refers to, Attendant to the loss of the priesthood at the end of the New Testament era, era, in the time in which spiritual power was manifest, a true understanding of the function and necessity of the priesthood was also lost. Further, the church would, which could no longer say, silver and gold have I none, could also no longer say, rise up and walk. Many claimed to possess the tree of everlasting light, yet none produced the fruits of that tree planted by the Savior. At such, the Savior said to Joseph Smith, They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. From the days of the Reformation, a large segment of Christianity had denied the necessity of formal ordination or conferral of divine authority, stating instead that all men and women as Christians constituted a priesthood of believers. 
Another segment perpetuated the falsehood that only a small minority of Christian community, the trained clergy, were entitled to ordination and priesthood. Both positions missed the mark and resulted in major misunderstandings. Without the blessings of the priesthood, man could not come to know God or gain those powers of godliness which prepare him for life with God and angels. As the Lord stated, And this greater priesthood administereth the gospel, and which prepareth him for life with God, gospel, and holdeth the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. What are the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood? Well, that would be the temple. Back to the quote from DNC 84. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, the power of godliness, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live, meaning and live with him in exaltation. The phrase, there is no God today. The meaning is, as stated in verse 6, Do not believe in miracles, for now there are no miracles. God has done his work. This is exactly what rationalists during the Age of Enlightenment in the 19th century maintained. They made human scientific knowledge the highest standard of truth. Unable to explain the miraculous, miraculous scientifically, they treated it as myth or denied it. Rationalism became the nurse of infidelity. Theologians and philosophers, ministers and rabbis from various persuasions during the 1960s united to announce the death of God. Evidencing that they were without divine direction, they determined that direct intervention of divine power was a thing of the past, that man's present plight was one of pathetic alienation. Those who knew not the living God could hardly teach him. Others profess a God known only to the ancients. There is no God today. The Lord and the Redeemer hath done his work. They rejoiced in the revelations and visions of a bygone day. They thrilled to biblical accounts of apostolic and prophetic power. These same individuals, however, recoiled at the thought or suggestion that God can speak and has spoken anew in this day, and that gifts and signs and wonders, that priesthood keys and powers, that prophets and apostles and visions are available once again. Many contend that the act of atonement was undertaken on a cross some 2,000 years ago, and that no righteous work performed in the 20th century will have any efficacy, virtue, or force, or can make or can make a difference, for God's work is done. Isn't that a sad commentary on the state of religion after the great apostasy that evidently God cannot do any more work? They limit God. No wonder they cannot progress. They limit God in his power. He is not an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God. He is a God of limitations, and that God I could not have faith in. 28 verse 6, the phrase, he is not a God of miracles, meaning numerous and varied have been the approaches used by many for centuries to deny the miraculous. In our day, it is common for religious-minded individuals to accept the miracles of the past, but deny the same in this enlightened day. Others seek to provide naturalistic explanations for the miraculous in order to demonstrate that God and his anointed servants simply work within well-planned but required bounds. The effect of both approaches is a weakening of faith and an increase in the distance between man and God. No, God doesn't work within limited bounds. God has the power to command directly all the elements and do the miraculous. 28 verse 7, the phrase, eat, drink, and be merry. This philosophy spawned in the infernal realms has been perpetuated for millennia. It is a humanistic in scope, carnal in approach, and damning in effect. It centers man's mind on himself, the present, while diverting his attention from the needs of others, from absolute values, either morally and decency here, or ultimate rewards or presentment hereafter. It incorporates the belief of such noted antichrist as Sherem, Nehor, and Korhor. Its doctrines consist of such positions as the following. No man can know anything which is to come. Whatsoever man does is no crime. 
When a man is dead, that is the end thereof, and all mankind shall be saved at the last day. That is, all men shall have eternal life. These are damning doctrines, indeed, from this philosophy. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, cautioned against this attitude, quote, The philosophy of ritual prodigalism is eat, drink, and be merry, and God will beat us with a few stripes. This is a cynical and shallow view of God, of self, and of life. God never can justify us in committing a little sin. He is the God of the universe, not some night court judge with whom we can haggle and plea bargain. Of course God is forgiving, but he knows the intents of our hearts. He also knows what good we might have done while AWOL, absent without leave. In any case, what others do is no excuse for the discipline from whom much is required. Besides, on the straight and narrow path, there are simply no corners to be cut. End of quote. 28 verse 8, the phrase, nevertheless, fear God, referred to. In the, pre in the pretense of being God-fearing, many of the doctrines of the devil find root. It is often from those who verbalize allegiance to Christ and his gospel that so much that is cruel and inhumane and indecent flows, particularly to the those who suggest a course that is more godlike. The phrase, he will justify in committing a little sin. Little sins, like tiny acorns, produce massive oaks. Out of small things proceed that which is great. Tares once small and indistinguishably eventually choke the wheat. This philosophy makes about as much sense as saying, I'm just a little pregnant. No, God cannot look the, on sin with the least degree of allowance. Doctrine and Covenants 1, verse 31. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles commented on the foolishness of thinking that we are better off for having sinned for the experience of it. Quote, the idea that one is better off after one has sinned and repented is a devilish lie of the adversary. Does anyone here think that it is better to learn firsthand that a certain blow will break a bone or a certain mixture of chemicals will explode and sear off our skin? Are we better off after we have sustained and then healed such injuries? I believe we all can see that it is better to heed the warnings of wise persons who know the effects on our bodies. End of quote. Being able to learn from the examples of others would be more wisdom. Moroni saw our day in vision, a day when there shall be heard of fires and tempests and vapors of smoke in foreign lands, and there shall also be heard of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places. Yea, it shall come in a day when there shall be a great pollution upon the face of the earth. There shall be many murders and robbings and lines and deceivings and whoredoms and all manner of abominations, when there shall be many who shall say, Do this or do that, it mattereth not, for the Lord will uphold such at the last day. But woe unto such, for they are in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. One famous saint today is, well, it's okay. God loves us. He loves all of his children. Therefore, we'll love. he'll save us because he loves us. Oh, brothers and sisters, do not get caught in that trap. God can love you in the celestial kingdom just as easy as he can in an exaltation in the celestial kingdom. This is not about whether God loves us. This is all about whether we love God. And if you love God, therefore, you keep his commandments. This is about us, not him. Do you love God? Then if you do, then you must keep his commandments. Because if we do not, then he cannot accept us into his kingdom. So this is not about whether God loves us. This is whether about God can accept me. Our God is merciful and great. He is slow to anger and eager to accept the repentant sinner. But that same God is faithful in his punishment of the haughty evildoer. He that sins knowingly against the light and does despite to the spirit of grace. Our Heavenly Father is more liberal in his views, Joseph Smith observed, and boundless in his mercy and blessings than we are ready to believe or receive. 
On the other hand, the prophet noted, the Lord is more terrible to the workers of iniquity, more awful in the executions of his punishment, and more ready to detect every false way than we are apt to suppose him to be. End of quote. The true doctrine in this field was given to the prophet Joseph Smith in the revelation that became known as the preface to the doctrine and covenants. I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be given. See, there's no such thing as unconditional mercy or unconditional repentance. He that repents not, from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with man, saith the Lord of hosts. The phrase, lie a little, meant, Yea, the devil saith to them, Deceive and lie in wait to catch, that ye may destroy. Behold, there is no harm. And thus he flattereth them, and leadeth them along, until he dragged their souls down to hell. And thus he causeth them to catch themselves in their own snare. And thus he goeth up and down to and fro in the earth, seeking to destroy the souls of men. There is no such as a lie a little. That's just like sin a little. What a deceptive philosophy. President Gordon B. Hinckley admonished us to resist the temptation to lie a little. Quote, Nephi so described the people of his day as he also described so many of our day. How easy it is for us to say, we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent. But how difficult for so many to resist the temptation to lie a little cheat a little, still a little, bear fault witness in speaking gossip words about others. Rise above it. Be strong in the simple virtue of honesty. End of quote. Verse 10, chapter 28, verse 8, the phrase, take advantage because of his words, referred to. One who seeks to ensnare another because of his words, who eagerly waits to make another an offender for a word, who lays verbal traps for his fellow man, such a one is of the devil. His reward from beneath, and his reward is from beneath, not from above. The charitable person rejoices not in iniquity, nor in the mistakes or misfortunes of others, but rather in their success. The phrase, dig a pit for thy neighbor, meant the proverb wisely has it, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it shall return upon him. Joseph pleaded in the dedicatory prayer at the Kirtland Temple, quote, We ask thee, Holy Father, to establish the people that shall worship and honorably hold a name, and standing in this thy house to all generations for all eternity, that no weapon form against them shall prosper, and he who diggeth a pit for them shall fall into the same himself, that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over thy people." upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. And if any people shall rise against this people, thine anger shall be kindled against them. End of quote from Dr. Covenants 109. The phrase, if it so be that we are guilty, meant, or just in case we discover there is a God, he will chasten us slightly, and we will enter into that heaven prepared for all men and women. Again, what a vain and false and foolish doctrine. Think, God will wink an eye at sin. The phrase, God will beat us with a few stripes, and then at the last day, we'll be saved. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency spoke against this falsehood, quote, One deception is what some erroneously call premeditated repentance. There is no such doctrine in this church. This may sound subtle, sound subtly appealing, but it is in fact pernicious and a false concept. Its objective is to persuade us that we can consciously and deliberately transgress with the forethought that quick repentance will permit us to enjoy the full blessings of the gospel, such as temple blessings or remission. True repentance can be a long painful process. This foolish doctrine was foreseen by Nephi. And there should be also many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. There is no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, well, God will beat us with a few stripes. And at last we will be saved in the kingdom of God. Oh, how surprised they will be. 
back to his old Faust quote, all of our covenants must not only be received through ordinance, but to be eternal must also be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. This divine stamp of approval is placed upon our ordinance and covenants only through faithfulness. The false idea of so-called premeditated repentance involves an element of deception, but the Holy Spirit of promise cannot be deceived. End of quote. Chapter 28, verse 9, the phrase, and shall be puffed up in their hearts, seek to hide their counsel from God, and their word are in the, and their words are in the dark. And their words are in the dark. President Ezra Taft Benson gives the following warning concerning being puffed up in our hearts and seeking to hide deep their counsels, faults, and vain and foolish doctrines from the Lord. The Doctrine and Covenants tells us that the Book of Mormon is recorded of a, the record of a fallen people. Why did they fall? This is one of the major messages of the Book of Mormon. Mormon gives the answer in the closing chapters of the book in these words, Behold, the pride of this nation, or the people of the Nephites, have proven their destruction. And then, lest we miss this momentous Book of Mormon message, from that fallen people, the Lord warns us in the Doctrine and Covenants, Beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. Pride is a very misunderstood sin, and many are sinning in ignorance. In the scriptures, there is no such thing as righteous pride. It is always considered a sin. Therefore, no matter how the word, world uses the term, we must understand how God uses the term so that we can understand the language of holy writ and profit thereby. The central feature of pride is enmity. Enmity towards God and enmity towards our fellow men. Enmity means hatred towards hostility to or a state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over us. Continuing President Benson, pride is essential competitive in nature. We pit our will against God's. When we direct our pride towards God, it is in the spirit of my will and not thine be done. As Paul said, they seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Our will and competition to God's will allows desires, appetites, and passions to go unbridled. The proud cannot accept the authority of God giving direction to their lives. They pit their perceptions of truth against God's great knowledge, their ability versus God's priesthood power, their accomplishments against his mighty works. Oh, how silly human pride can be. Continuing President Benson, our enmity toward God takes on many labels, such as rebellion, hard-heartedness, stiff-neckedness, unrepentant, puffed up, easily offended, and sign seekers. The proud wish God would agree with them. They aren't interested in changing their opinions to agree with God's. Pride results in secret combinations. Thus they seek deep to hide their counsel from God, which are built up to get power, gain, and the glory of the world. This fruit of the sin of pride, namely secret combinations, brought down both the Jaredite and the Nephite civilizations, and has been and will yet be the cause of the fall of many nations, probably even America. Continuing President Benson, pride is a damning sin in the true sense of the word. It limits or stops progression. The proud are not easily taught. They won't change their minds to accept truths because to do so implies they have been wrong. Therefore, their works are usually in the dark, which can cause them to be easily offended. The antidote for pride is humility, meekness, submissiveness. It is the broken heart and the contrite spirit which humility is to openly accept and live in the counsels of God and to have our works known in the light. End of President Benson's quote. 28 verse 10, the phrase, the blood of the saints shall cry from the ground means, too many noble and great ones have lived and preached and taught, too many have sacrificed their comforts, their homes, their families, and their own lives. Too many have laid their all on the altar, too many have given their lives to the kingdom of God for the wicked and unbelieving to defile the earth. 
Who with impunity can defile that which the Almighty God has made? God will not be mocked, nor will his plan for the salvation of men and the socialization of the earth be foiled by those with carnal cares and diabolical desires. Truth will prevail. Righteousness will reign. The cry of the blood of the saints and the prophets from all ages ascends to the ears of the Lord of Savaot for justice to be rendered, for wrongs to be righted, and for evil to be abolished. Even Mother Earth herself cries to the heavens, saying, quote, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men. I am pained, I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. When shall I rest and be cleansed from the filthiness which has gone out of me? When will my Creator sanctify me, that I may rest, and the righteous for a season abide upon my face? To such penetrating pleas the Master has sworn with an oath, As I live, so shall I come in the last day, in the days of wickedness and vengeance, and the day shall come that the earth shall rest. But before that day the heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and great tribulation shall be among the children of men. But my people will I preserve. One day the earth will have its rest and will receive its baptism by fire and be cleansed from the wickedness upon her. 28 verse 11, the phrase, they have all gone out of the way, meaning those who have gone out of the way are those who have strayed from the Lord himself, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The way of life and salvation is the way of holiness, a straight and narrow way. The way of death and destruction is wide and widening and ever accommodating. Straight is the gate and narrow the way that leadeth unto the exaltation and the continuation of lives. That is, eternal life, the continuation of the family unit in eternity. And few there be that find it, because ye receive me not in this world, neither do ye know me. The phrase, they have become corrupted, refers to. DNC 33, 3-4 informs us, For behold, the field is white already to harvest, and it is the eleventh hour, and the last time that I shall call laborers to my vineyard. And my vineyard has become corrupted every whit, and there is none which doeth good, save it be a few. And they err in many instances, because of priestcrafts, all having corrupt minds. 28 verse 12, the phrase, the churches have become corrupted and lifted up in pride. Meaning this verse could just as easily apply to some of the congregations in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as to churches created by men without authority from God. Please be careful and think when Nephi says that churches have become corrupted and lifted up in pride, he is talking about all of those churches that are not churches of the true church. No, there could be congregations out there that are lifted up in the pride of their hearts. And this could also apply to us as a people if we are not careful. This is not just to non-members, brothers and sisters. Do not make that error. Like in the scriptures unto ourselves. 28 verse 13, the phrase, They rob the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. A church which has not the inclination or the power to save a person from want and starvation has not the power to save a soul from hell. In addressing those claiming to be shepherds of Israel, the spiritual leaders during the days of Ezekiel, Jehovah said, Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I liveth, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock become a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock, I will require my flock at their hands and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. See, that could apply to us and our leaders and us as being leaders if we do it just to build ourselves up and not to bring souls unto God and with an eye single to his glory. Moron, I warned, behold, I'm only speaking to you. Those in the last days, as if you were present, and yet ye are not. Be it, behold, Jesus Christ has shown me, you unto me, and I know your doings. And I know that ye do walk in the pride of your hearts. Again, this is not for non-members. This is for all of us, members included, and maybe especially for members. 
and there are none save a few only who do not lift themselves up in the pride of their hearts unto the wearing of fine apparel, unto envies and strifes and malice and persecutions and all manner of iniquities. And your churches, yea, every one, have become polluted because of the pride of your hearts. See, that can enter into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints just as it can in any other church. For behold, ye do love money, and your substance, and your fine apparel, and your adorning of your churches, more than you love the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted. See, there are some congregations who their fast offerings cannot meet the needs of the people in the Lord. Well, evidently, they love their money. Moroni then warns, Behold, the sword of vengeance hangeth over you, and the time soon cometh that the Lord avengeth the blood of the saints upon you, for he will not suffer their cries any longer. The phrase, they rob the poor because of their fine clothing. A person who becomes more concerned with his manner of dress, and particularly with its costliness, than with his manner of life, will yet know a day when the nakedness of his deeds and the emptiness of his soul will be exposed. Again, that applies to non-members or members alike. Priestcraft spawns its own fashions and dons its own robes. It seeks to hide its spiritual poverty beneath worldly wealth. Artificial awe and superficial splendor are often in lieu of quiet peace and soothing brilliance of the light of heaven. Brothers and sisters, Moroni is warning members in the last days more than he is warning non-members. He is speaking to us. He said, I have seen you. I've seen the church in the last days. And there are those who profess to be members of the true church. But by the way they act, the way they dress, the way they talk, they are not truly members. In describing one of how remarkable and wonderful occasion in Nephite history where the saints of God cared as much for their neighbor as for themselves, Mormon wrote, and they did impart of their substance, every man according to that which he had, to the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted. And they did not wear costly apparel, yet they were neat and comely. Thou shalt not be proud in thy heart, the Lord said to the Latter-day Saints. Let all thy garments be plain, and their beauty the beauty of the work of thine own hands. And let all things be done in cleanliness before me. Do we seek after the fashions and the things of the world more so than after the things of God, therefore keeping us from helping our neighbors with our substance? That's something we will all have to answer to. 28 verse 14, the phrase, they wear stiff necks and high heads, was an apt scriptural description of pride, stubbornness, or spiritual incurability, is stiff-neckedness. To be stiff-necked is to be resistant to divine counsel. The stiff-necked are unwilling to bow the head in humble reverence towards him whom all blessings flow. Those with high heads view with disdain and condescension the meek and the obedient. Possessed of a false sense of independence, they perceive divine restraints as strifling to their exercise of agency and their natural proclivities. Ironically, theirs is a course contrary to the nature of God and thus contrary to the nature of happiness. Brothers and sisters, the commandments are not restraints that restrain us. Commandments free us from Satan and give us more agency. What more agency could you want than finally becoming like God? Talk about having complete agency. The phrase, a few, the humble followers of Christ referred to, Nephi's words pertain primarily to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. These verses, 7 through 32 in chapter 38, pertain not only to churches after the manner of men, but to those who belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The phrase, they do error because they are taught by the precepts of men, means the warning is most sober. Faithful members of the church have in many instances been deceived, their faith weakened, and their discipleship diluted through the mingling of scriptures with the philosophies of men. Think of critical race theory. Think of DEI. Think of transgenderism. That is mingled sometimes with scripture in our congregations, in our churches, and just dilutes the doctrine. 
The marriage of Zion and Babylon is an unholy union. It is vain attempt to harmonize and integrate disparate kingdoms. In the quest for peace being warring, between warring ideologies, gospel principles are compromised and costly concessions made. You can never mix the doctrines of the gospel with the philosophy and ideologies of the world and have truth. It will never happen. So let's knock it off. DNC 50, 2 through 4 and 9 warns, Behold, verily I say unto you, there are many spirits which are false spirits which have gone forth in the earth deceiving the world. And also Satan has sought to deceive you, that he might overthrow you. Behold, I the Lord have looked upon you, and have seen abominations in the church that profess my name. Wherefore, let every man beware, lest he do that which is not in truth and righteousness before me. Chapter 28, verse 15, woe, 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 three woes. Here Nephi suggests that the seductive mistress of the kingdom of darkness are worldly wisdom, riches, immorality, and purveyors of false doctrines. The inclusion of teaching false doctrine in this list of spiritual harlots accentuates the alluring but damning effect of tainted theology upon mankind. Thus, deep sorrow and affliction, that's what three woes means, God's judgments, woe, 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 will be brought upon the wise, learned, and rich that are puffed up in pride of their hearts, those who preach false doctrine, those who commit whoredoms, and pervert the right way of God, especially those in the kingdom who do that and try to mix it with the truth. 28 verse 16, the phrase that turn aside the just for a thing of naught means to be just is to be obedient to the laws of God. The disobedient, having chosen darkness, are offended by the light, shun the light, and seek to put out the light. The proud reject the just and judge them to be of little value, a thing of naught, and their words and actions as little consequence. By so doing, they set them, up, they set them at naught. The phrase, revive against that which is good, meant the guilty take the truth to be hard. Therefore, revile, therefore, they revile against righteousness, seeking to rationalize their wicked behavior. The phrase, that day that they are fully ripe in iniquity, refers to the breach between Zion and Babylon will widen as we approach the time of the second coming of the Son of Man. As more and more of the meek among men so live as to rise to celestial heights, even so the wicked will sink even deeper into the depths of depravity and despair. When the Lord Jesus returns in glory, he will find a society of the pure in heart, a people whose righteousness is known and evident. He will also find a mass of humanity whose abominations exceed those of Sodom and Gomorrah. They will be ripe in iniquity, ready to be plucked up from the land of the living and removed from the paradisiacal earth. 28 verse 18, the phrase, the great and abominable church must fall, refers to, the various elements of the church of the devil will war among themselves, even to the point that they will become drunken with their own blood. Indeed, all who war against the house of Israel shall fall into the pit which they digged to ensnare the people of the Lord, and all who fight against Zion shall be destroyed. The great and the abominable church will at this time, just prior to the millennium, be destroyed, and in the midst of it all, the Lord will preserve and defend his people as he did anciently. So it's never, is God on our side? It's always, are we on God's side? That's what you want, to be on God's side. 28 verse 19, the phrase, the kingdom of the devil must shake, referred to. The marvelous work and a wonder, the restoration of the gospel, laid the foundation of truth in these last de latter days. The house of faith has been constructed upon the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as its chief cornerstone. With the erection of this temple of truth, the ensign to the world, all nations are invited to rally around the gospel standard, and the knowledge of God will spread to all corners of the globe. The hoisting of the banner of truth also signaled the downfall of that great and spacious building, whose foundation is the devil. 
the restoration has caused the kingdom of the evil one to shake. The phrase, they which belong to it must, not, must needs be stirred up into repentance, means, to the devil's chagrin, many persons in the last days who have been once been a part of the great abominable church, all churches save that of the Lamb, will forsake the pageantry and praise of the secular congregations to seek for that which approbation, to seek for that approbation which only the Lord can give. Responding to that inner urge to worship the true and living God, they have gathered and will yet gather to congregations of saints, endure the crosses of the world, and come to despise the shame of it. This prophetic utterance also pertains to persons with membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but whose lives have not been wholly consecrated to the Lord. These are they who lack whose lack of commitment has barred them from the blessings of full citizenship in the kingdom of God. These face a day of decision. It is either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the devil. Those who continue to waver are eventually waft into the hellish hordes of Beelzebub. 28 verses 20 through 22, Strategies of the Devil. As Nephi early identified false doctrines promoted by Satan, he also identified some of the false strategy, some of the strategies that promote the kingdom of the devil. The vile one is extremely versatile. His approaches vary according to the conditions of the time and the specific weakness of individuals or groups. Some persons are moved upon by Satan to become rash or angry or violent and feel compelled to organize riots, lead marches, and promote legislation against those things which are good. Others are tempted to be quiet and passive and different, overwhelmed with opulence, satiated and satisfied that all things will and should continue as they are, leading them to believe all is well. See verse 21. While still others he deceives by flattery that there is no hell or devil, and he is able to grasp them with his awful chains from whence there is no deliverance. Verse 22. Bishop Richard C. Edgley of the presiding bishop warned us of the reality of the attacks of the adversary. Quote, we have had very specific warnings regarding Satan's powerful influence and determination. Nephi prophesied more than 2,500 years ago of the trials and turbulence that you would face. You all know the scripture. It is found in the 28th chapter of 2 Nephi. I believe this scripture is true. I believe the time is now, and I believe the target is you. For the most part, Satan has made great strides in establishing and selling his value system, which is based upon the Son of Man, not the Son of God. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and there is no hell. His is a value system based upon selfishness, self-indulgence, and immediate gratification. Thus we see devastating decisions constantly being made by those of your age. We see cultures infested with drugs, sex, alcohol, pornography, laziness, and many other spiritually devastating practices. But that does not have to be you. President Gordon B. Hinckley has warned us and pled with us. I wish to say in the strongest language of which I am capable to say to stay away from moral iniquity. You know what is right and wrong. You cannot use ignorance as an excuse for unacceptable behavior. I beg of you, my dear young friends, to avoid such behavior. I, it will not be easy. It will require self-discipline. You need the strength that comes of prayer. End of President Hinckley and Bishop Edgley's quotes. Second Nephi 2820, he shall rage in the hearts of men and stir them up to anger, refers to, inherent in the prophecy that the gospel will go to all the world with a breadth of success never before known is the current prophecy that the devil will rage and, rage and rant in a terrible trade not known heretofore too. Elder Marvin J. Asher, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, identified the danger that comes from following Satan's temptations to take advantage of each other. Quote, it should come as no surprise that one of the adversary's tactics in the latter days is to stir up hatred among the children of men. He loves to see us criticize each other, make fun or take advantage of our neighbor's known flaws, and generally pick on each other. The Book of Mormon is clear from where all anger, malice, greed, and hate come from. 
By the looks of what we constantly see depicted in the news media, it appears that SANE is doing a pretty good job. In the name of reporting the news, we are besieged with sometimes graphic depictions, too often in living color, of greed, extortion, violent sex crimes, and insults between businesses, athletics, and political opponents. End of quote. Anger is a secondary emotion caused by primary emotions such as fear, frustration, envy, etc. Perhaps one of the primary emotions that is causing such anger against that which is good in the last days is what Mormon called the sorrowing of the damned. After great destruction and war, Mormon saw among the, among the people their lament that should be there. I apologize for that. their lamentation and their mourning and their sorrow before the Lord. And he said, My heart did begin to rejoice within me, knowing the mercies and long suffering of the Lord, therefore supposing that he would be merciful unto them, that they would again become a righteous people. However, he learned that his hope was in vain because their sorrowing was not unto repentance because of the goodness of God, but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. Perhaps today many come to realize there is no happiness in sin and sinful ideologies and philosophies of the world, thus causing anger against that which is good and right, because they don't want to change. They can't admit they're wrong. 28 verse 21, the phrase pacify and lull them away into carnal security, Bishop Richard C. Edgeley commented on the carnal desire so prevalent in today's world. Quote, Nephi describes Satan's sales technique as pacifying, flattering, and lulling as he declares all is well. Among other things, Satan would have us put in our bags. In our bags is immorality in all its forms, including pornography, language, dress, and behavior. But such evil deeds bring emotional distress, loss of spirituality, loss of self-respect, lost opportunities for a mission or temple marriage, and sometimes even unwanted pregnancy. Satan would enslave us by having us put drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and other addictive behaviors into our bags. End of quote. The devil need not resort alone to venomous and caustic causes. He also specializes in those subtle sophistries which will put to sleep an entire generation and anesthetize a people against an understanding of their sinful state. People become secure in their carnality, not only when they choose to pursue the trends of vice and immorality, but also when they lose the feeling of divine discontent, which motivate to repentance and improvement. The phrase all is well in Zion is, it is true that the manner and quality of life prescribed by the Lord for members of the church is above and beyond what could be understood and appreciated by those outside the faith. It is equally true that the church is in the line of its duty, is on a proper and appointed course, and that the kingdom of God on earth, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, will welcome in a future day the kingdom of heaven which is to come. But all is not well in Zion. Indeed, the Lord himself testified that it is the only true and living church upon the face of the earth, the whole earth, with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking of the church collectively and not individually. There is no safety, no true security in being static in one's spirituality or passive in the fight of faith. That crown associated with celestial glory is reserved only for those who are valiant in testimony. Courageous, those courageous in their conduct. Only those members of the church's, Christ church who count the cost of discipleship pay whatever price is necessary to be knowledgeable and informed Latter-day Saints and to live according to the highest standards of honesty and integrity qualified to go where God and angels are. The fray leadeth them away carefully down to hell means the devil too can wear white robes. With gentle kindness and feigned charity, he will lead many to hell. May we not be deceived, brothers and sisters. He also to, can come across as if he wears white robes.
do not be deceived by him and his philosophies. 28 verse 22, the phrase, there is no hell. It has become somewhat fashionable in the modern, I'm sorry, in the modern religious world to either metaphorize away the concept of hell or to deny it completely. Even among Latter-day Saints, there is some question on this vital matter. The scriptures affirm the reality of hell as both one, a state of mind, and two, a place of suffering and repentance in the world of spirits after death. Those who suppose hell to be only a state of mind do so out of an ignorance of the divine decree that all must suffer, must repent or suffer. Many who continue to deny the existence of hell do so out of malicious motives, no doubt to to save, to salve, save their own consciences and remove the fear of justice and retribution from those whom they would entice to join them. These shall know sooner or later of the reality of such a place. Satan, known in premortality as Lucifer, is an actual being from the unseen world. He is a spirit son of God, the Father, one who held a place of esteem and authority in the premortal existence, one who sought to amend the plan of the Father and bring glory unto himself, and one who, with his followers, was cast out of heaven to the earth. He is the Father of lies and the common enemy of all who seek salvation. He has great power, is a master of persuasion, and is an arch deceiver. Do not think that you cannot be fooled by him. He is a master arch deceiver. It will take the gift of the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters, to beat him. That's why he works so hard to make sure you do not learn how to use the Holy Ghost. Because once you know how to get revelation from the Holy Ghost in your life, then Satan knows his power is limited or even done with. 28 verse 22, the phrase, I am no devil, for there is none. One of the greatest lies perpetuated is that there is no devil. President Marion G. Romney, the first president of the presidency affirmed the reality of Satan with this testimony. Quote, a corollary to the pernicious falsehood that God is dead is the equal per pernicious doctrine that there is no devil. Satan himself is the father of both of these lies. To believe them is to surrender to him. Such surrender has always led, is leading now, and will continue to lead men to destruction. Latter-day Saints know there is a God. With like certainty, they know that Satan lives, that he is a powerful personage of spirit, the arch enemy of God, of man, and of righteousness. The reality of the existence of both God and devil is con conclusively established by the scriptures and by human experience. End of quote. Chapter 28, verse 23. The phrase, all that have been seized must stand before God, means one of the central doctrines of salvation taught with repetitive emphasis and clarity in the Book of Mormon is eternal judgment. The principle principle that every person will stand before the bar of God to account for his or her deeds. Those who have received the truth with eagerness and have kept the commandments of God, those who have traversed the straight path which leads to life will find a place with that God hereafter. Those who have chosen to follow the path of least resistance, the course charted by the evil engineer of the wide path, will forfeit all privileges of seeing or associating with God or the godly. The phrase, a lake of fire and brimstone, means the realization and conscience of the wicked at the day of judgment will be so severe in realizing they could have had much, they could have had more blessings if only they had obeyed, that it is like a fire of brimstone. So, their consciences will be so seared. The phrase, which is endless torment, meaning that they will suffer godly torment since endless is one of God's names. As Doctrine and Covenants 19 points out, for behold, the mysteries of godliness, how great it is. For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal's punishment is God's punishment. Endless punishment is God's punishment. Thus, those who suffer in hell will eventually be redeemed to a celestial kingdom. But until then, they must suffer an endless punishment, meaning a godly punishment. 
28 verses 24 through 32. In this section, Nephi reviews the religious condition of the world during the latter days and pronounces an eightfold woe unto those who are responsible for the evil ex existing. 28, 24. One to him that is ease at Zion. A general woe when pronouncing pronounced upon the members of the church who are at ease in Zion, the man or woman who is not on guard against evil or who is not courageous in the fight against spiritual stupor and apathy. Those who have enlisted in the army of the Lord must be vigilant, ever on guard. The people of God are expected to be active, laboring for their own salvation and that of others. Millions are in jeopardy. There is no time for idleness nor for folly. 28.25, all is well. Want to him who excuses his indifference with the assumption that all is well when it is not. 28 verse 26, the precepts of men, meaning empty forms without spirituality. Acts, Isaiah 29 13 puts it, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as they draw near unto me with their mouths, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. Woe unto him who hearkened to such precepts, for he naturally is in danger of becoming an infidel, denying the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. False doctrines are likely to take the form of futile ceremonies. Vain worship, many, vain worship may prepare the way for soul-destroying doctrines. 28 verse 27, we need no more, meaning progress is necessary to the welfare of man. Woe to him who saith, we need no more. When a person needs no more prayer, no more instruction, no more work of the Lord, no more fellowship, his condition is one of stagnation, which will, unless cured in time, end in spiritual death. Do we sometimes make the mistake when President Nelson or any other prophet says we're now doing this and they add or change something, say we need no more changes in the earth? That is from the devil. 28 verse 28, the phrase angry because of the truth. Woe to all such for their anger is a proof that they have built their spiritual files upon loose sand. They are trembling for fear of following. If they had built upon the rock, they would have faith and stand firm. They would rejoice in the truth. They would recognize it when they heard it, as the sheep recognizes the voice of the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Nephi explained that his record spoke of Jesus and of Jesus and persuadeth all men to believe in him, to endure to the end, which is eternal life. And it speaketh harshly against sin, according to the plainness of the truth. Wherefore, no man will be angry at the words which I have written, save he shall be of the spirit of the devil. But that tells you something about those who fight so hard against the Book of Mormon. That spirit which causes anger, which the truth is begotten by the father of lies. The phrase, he that is built upon the rock, receive it with gladness, meaning those who truly center their lives in the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of Israel, those who treasure the revelations of heaven as the rock upon which testimony is built and eternal life is found. These earnestly and sincerely seek for further light and knowledge and rejoice in additional announcements from the Lord or his servants and prophets. There is only one spirit that would cause one to be angry at the Book of Mormon or any other revelation from God, and that would be the spirit of the devil. Verse, chapter 28, verse 29, the phrase, we need no more of the word of God. Pharisees of 2,000 years ago rejected Jesus because he represented and proposed an extension to the Old Testament. Pharisees of this last dispensation reject Mormonism because it stands as a supplement, an addendum to what may regard as a perfect, complete, and inerrant Bible. In a letter to his uncle, Silas Smith, Joseph Smith wrote in 1833 that the Lord has never given the world to understand by anything heretofore revealed that he had ceased forever to speak to his creatures when sought unto in a proper manner. Why the prophet then asked, should it be thought a thing incredible that he should be pleased to speak again in these last days for their salvation? It is the height of hypocrisy to be outwardly observant and religious and at the same time clothed and opposed to spiritual verities. 
In short, one is not religious who rejects divinely sent theological truths. One of the prominent Book of Mormon themes is a warning to Latter-day readers to deny not the revelations of God. In chapter 28 of 2 Nephi, the prophet Nephi describes evil actions and attitudes of the last days. And then, as though Nephi were saving the most horrid and abominable attitude for last, he warns, Yea, woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of man, and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yea, woe be unto him that saith, We have received, and we need no more. See verses 26 and 27. The subject is so important to Nephi and the attitude so deadly that he devotes approximately 20 more verses to the matter, including the poignant sermon that we read in 2 Nephi 29. To those of our day who have become content with an ancient scriptural record, the Lord gives timeless counsel. Wherefore, because that ye have a Bible, do ye not suppose that it contains all my words? Neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. Joseph Smith taught, From what we can draw from the scriptures relative to the teachings of heaven, we are inclined to think that men, much instruction has been given to men since the beginning, which we do not possess now. This may not agree with the opinions of some of our friends who are bold to say that we have everything written in our Bible which God ever spoke to man since the world began, and that if he had ever said anything more, we should certainly have received it. But when we ask, does it remain for a people who never had faith enough to call down one scrap of revelation from heaven, and for all they have now are indebted to the faith of other people who lived hundreds and thousands of years before them, does it remain for them to say how much God has spoken and how much he has not spoken? We have what we have, and the Bible contains what it contains. But to say that God never said anything more to man than is they are recorded, would be saying at once that we have at last received a revelation, for it must require one to advance thus far, because it is nowhere said in the volume by the mouth of God that he would not, after giving what is there contained, speak again. And if any man has found out for a fact that the Bible contains all that God has ever revealed to man, he has ascertained it by an immediate revelation other than has been previously written by the prophets and apostles. In other words, it takes revelation to know that there will be no more revelation. That's how bizarre it is in Christianity that the Bible is all has been said by God and he will give no more. Well, you can only know that by revelation. You are denying there's no more revelation, but to deny there's no more revelation, you must have a revelation. What idiocy. To say the Lord cannot speak today as in days of past would put limitations on God. President James E. Faust explained the need for modern revelation. Quote, Does God love us less than those led by the ancient prophets? Do we need his guidance and instruction less? Reason suggests this cannot be. Does he not care? Has he lost his voice? Has he gone on a permanent vacation? Does he sleep? The unreasonable of each of these proposals is self-evident. End of quote. Chapter 28, verse 30, line upon line, means the Lord's system for educating the spirits of men is one of teaching and testing. For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and try and prove them herewith. Such is the Lord's program of prerequisites. The treasures of heaven are rationed to those who have proven faithful stewards over the truths they have received. In his wisdom, love, and mercy, the Lord grants unto men all that he seeth fit they should have. To blind a man with heaven's rays does this leave him in darkness. That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. We will first be tried and tested with what we have before he gives us more. The phrase, they shall learn wisdom, means the wisdom of heaven can be obtained by obedience, the righteous application to the laws of heaven. There is no wisdom in rebellion and disobedience. The phrase, unto him that receiveth, I will give more, meant, it is given unto many, Alma explained, to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of the word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heathen diligence which they give unto him. And therefore, 
He that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the world, word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the world, until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. Such persons, Alma observes, become captive to the devil because of their ignorance and hard hardness, hardness of heart. They are bound down by the chains of hell. Make sure you catch the warning by Alma. We are under strict command that you only impart the things the Spirit tells you as the Spirit tells you. Do not share spiritual sacred experiences just any time. You only share them when the Spirit tells you to share them. If you share sacred things God has given you and you should not have, then God will stop giving them to you because he cannot trust you to keep your mouth shut. They are given for you and you only unless he commands otherwise. 28 verse 31, the phrase shall hearken unto the precepts of men means even among church members, the saints of the Most High, those who have been who have by covenant come out of the world in the church of God, there are those who seek to keep one foot in the world. They have a residence in Zion, but visit Babylon periodically. Their membership may be in the former, but their hearts are in the latter. Their ultimate trust may be in the power of God, but their interim interest is the arm of the flesh. Too many in the church today err because they are taught by the precepts of men rather than by the scriptural canon, the words of the living oracles, that's prophets, or the revelations of the Holy Spirit. The theories of men accent their teachings, and the philosophies of the learned determine their course in life. They view the world and even the workings of God through the lens of their own partial but particular discipline or field of study. There are among us many learned and adept educators who teach things that are contrary to the divine will. They seem to be more concerned with sustaining the dogmas of their academic disciplines than in discovering ultimate truth. There are historians of self-announced renown whose work, works are false, much of their writing being harmful, speculative, and out of harmony with the divine will. The saints of God may be educators, authors, scientists, or historians. They may be soldiers, farmers, or judges. They may be shepherds of sheep or doves of cattle or drovers of cattle. They may earn their bread in any one of a thousand temporal pursuits. All of these things, however, are but vocations. They are also and preeminently the elders or sisters of Israel and the saints of the Most High. They are the Lord's agents and his representatives. These are their true vocations. Their labor in our Father's business must take precedence over all else. Through those labors they can earn the eternal bread of which men may eat and never hunger more. If and then when there is a conflict of interest between members' earthly pursuits and their heavenly pursuits, it is time to take stock and choose to walk in the course charted from on high. The saints' chief obligation is to follow the Lord and work for his interests. Their pledge, sworn on the altars of God, is and must be that they will never do anything to destroy faith. They must never perform or an act or espouse a cause that runs counter to the needs and the purposes of the church. If this means they forsake the course of their colleagues in the world to pursue, so be it. Each member must come to believe and declare with, sober, with, declare with soberness the kingdom of God or nothing. Chapter 28, verse 32, the phrase, Woe be unto the Gentiles. This includes members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as well as non-members. For there are members and non-members alike that deny God by not partaking fully of the ordinance as, and covenances of the gospel. The phrase, mine arm is lengthened out all the day long, means there is almost no limit to the Lord's mercy, no end to his long suffering with his children. How merciful is our God unto us, exalted Jacob, for he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches, and he stresseth forth his hands unto them all the day long. Our test will be if we will accept his hand and submit to God in all things. Jacob further implored the covenant people to repent and come a full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he would cleave unto you. And while his arm of mercy is extended towards you in the light of day, harden not your hearts. However, mercy is not unconditional. 
It is conditional on repentance to the atonement of Christ and submission to his will. We now turn to 2 Nephi chapter 29. 29 verses 1 through 6, Nephi prophesied that when the great marvelous work of restoration foretold by Isaiah was about to begin with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, many would reject it and give the argument that they already had a Bible and had no need for another. A statement is its own refutation. The philosopher argues that there can be no absolutes, not realizing that such a pronouncement constitutes an absolute. To say there's no absolutes, you have just made an absolute. Oh, the philosophy is a matter so stupid. The false religionist argues that the Bible contains all rev revelation, not realizing that since the Bible makes no such claim for itself, the only way they could know this would be by a revelation. Thus men and women find themselves in the awkward position of claiming a revelation to say there is no revelation. Such is the confusion of which the kingdom of darkness is made. Every missionary who has labored among Christian nations had heard his Nephi's prophecy. This basis for rejecting the Book of Mormon fulfilled nearly countless times. The argument is, as the Lord suggests, most foolish. It is our modern counterpart to those of Jesus' day who rejected him in the presence of being loyal to the law of Moses. The irony, irony being that loyalty to the law of Moses demanded acceptance of Jesus as the Christ. The purpose of the law of Moses was to teach and testify of Christ. Such is also the purpose of the Book of Mormon, it being the most Christ-centered book ever written. Yet it is rejected in the name of loyalty to the Bible and loyalty to Christ. The logical extension of such reasoning would be to reject the Gospel of Mark in the name of loyalty to Matthew, or to reject the witness of Peter in the pretense of loyalty to Paul and his teachings. Indeed, some have done so, claiming contradictions between the early apostles. Yet the spirit, purpose, and doctrine of these special witnesses, like that of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, are the same. 29.1. Remember my covenants. That phrase, remember my covenants. Lord cov the, the Lord covenantal, the Lord's covenants, what it should be, the, the covenant made with Abraham concerning his righteous seed. That covenant included the promise that Abraham's descendants would be the stewards of the gospel of salvation among all nations of the earth. To Abraham and his seed went the promise that they would hold the priesthood and be the minister of salvation among all men. Further, Abraham and Sarah were promised that their union would be eternal and their posterity endless. In the complete and perfect sense, this promise is remembered by the seed of Abraham when a man and a woman kneel at an altar in the house of the Lord and receive the very promises made by the Lord anciently to Abraham and Sarah as father and mother of the faithful. 29 verse 2, the phrase promises unto Nephi. The Lord promised Nephi and his father that a remnant of the seed would be preserved even to the last days. Their posterity, it was prophesied, would hearken to the words of the Book of Mormon and be blessed with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thus they will be preserved in the great and dreadful day of Christ's return, that day in which those who reject the testimony of the Book of Mormon will be cut off from among those who are of the covenant. The phrase, my word shall hiss forth, means, this is the language of Isaiah, Isaiah 5.26. Its meaning, as used here, is that the word of the Lord will whistle or call forth for the attention of my, of all men. And we do those missionaries, we go out, and we whistle, we call forth, we are whispering and, and whistling, we're trying to bring people to the gospel covenant. The phrase for a standard of my people means the Book of Mormon is the standard by which all who are truly a covenant people, that is, all who are in true sense are of Israel, will be guided in the last days. 29 verse 3, the phrase, there cannot be any more Bible. The spirit of apostasy denies the spirit of revelation forever it forever seeks to seal the heavens. As Latter-day Saints, we do not believe the Bible. We, we not we not only believe the Bible, but we believe also that many sacred books will, will yet be restored. It is also our faith that we will yet receive a priest of the greater portions of the Book of Mormon writings. Quite a few years ago, a prominent clergyman in Salt Lake City criticized the church for, as he thought, trying to impose a fifth gospel on the public, referring more especially to the third book of Nephi. 
I remember that President B.H. Roberts of the Quorum of Seventy, in replying, expressed regret that the recognition of that book as a fifth gospel had come first from an outsider. Little did the clergyman realize that he was fulfilling prophecy by raising an objection against the Book of Mormon on the assumed ground that it is too much like the Bible. 29 verse 4 through 5, the phrase, And what thank they, the Jews, for the Bible? That spirit that praises dead prophets while rejecting living ones and that praises the Bible or reject the Book of Mormon is also found giving the most profound homage to the words of the Jews while persecuting those who are Jewish. We are greatly indebted to the faithful Jews who penned these words and countless others who courageously preserved them for us. The covenant that the Lord made with Abraham and his posterity is in part that those who bless them will also be blessed, while those who curse them will also be cursed. The Lord is reminding the Gentiles that it cost the best blood of past generations to bring forth this book of books. 29 verse 5, the phrase, Have you remembered the Jews? It is the Lord who asks, How have the Jews, though through, through whom the Bible came, been received? History answers by turning its blood-stained pages to the light, one by one, seemingly for endless ages. At the beginning of 1938, the unfortunate Jews in Germany appealed to the ruler of that nation for the mercy of salvation from destitution and extermination. They had been forcibly scattered and then persecuted for not having visible means of support or passports. In Bucharest, about that time, a Romanian government official is said to have announced that plans were being laid for a worldwide anti-Semitic congress, which would, of course, mean worldwide persecution. In Italy, the ruler is said to have informed the Jews February 16th 1938, that they would not be permitted to play a more important role in the national life than their individual, than their inform, than their informed, the, let me try again, they would not be permitted to play a more important part in national life than their individual abilities merit. In Austria, in January of 1938, the state council considered measures for the closing of the country to refugees from Poland and Romania, somewhat after the pattern of the old slave legislation in the United States before the Civil War. In, uh, on March uh, on March 1938, the situation of the Jewish population in Austria had become so critical that Jewish World Congress in Geneva petitioned the League of Nations to consider the problem of the martyrdom of Austrian Jews. The Congress showed that the Jewish death rate in Austria had risen from an average of four a day to 140. Jews ever were in need of a Messiah, they are now. Meanwhile, agitation in Palestine has been rife between Jews and Arabs until the stronghold seems to have been in the hands of the opponent of the Prince of Peace. 29 verse 5, the phrase, I have not forgotten my people. This is the promise of the Lord. The settlement of 200,000 Jews in recent years, this was written in 1955, is regarded as one of the miracles of history. Rabbi Samuel H. Gordon, Salt Lake City, is not quoted as saying, having said in the recent address that the spectacle of Palestine of today is one of race of agriculture, astute people becoming wedded to the soil after centuries of being confined to commercial activities. The land which 20 years ago could feed only 700,000 people now supports a population of 1,500,000 and has an orange export business of 18 million a, a year, two-thirds of its produce by Jews, he said. Industrial development in Palestine also has been stimulated by Jewish migration, he said. God has not forgotten his people. 29.6, the phrase, Thou fool, we read of no people within the covers of the Bible to whom the Lord would speak and who did not have the right to add to the number of its sacred books. Here the Lord points out the foolishness of people who never have been in sufficient favor with him to hear his voice now assuming the right to tell others that they cannot have such a privilege. This is especially ironic given that the Bible for which they claim such reverence, promises that the Lord will speak to all who inquire of him in faith. Just see James 1, 5. 29 verse 7, the phrase, Know ye not that there are more nations than one? 
All the earth's inhabitants are the children of God, and as such, all have claim upon his word. It matters not where they lived or when they lived. A just God cannot withhold his word from any who honestly seek it. Indeed, all are entitled to the opportunities in his providence and economy to accept or reject those truths by which sins are remitted and eternal rewards obtained. To grant one people prophets and apostles is to assure that all might have prophets and apostles. For God to speak to one is for God to assume that he will speak to all. That faith which opened the heavens in the old world also opened the heavens in the new world and upon the isles of the sea. The phrase, even upon all the nations of the earth, refers to, the scriptures seem to indicate that at one time or another the gospel has been taught among all nations of the earth. In our day we have been charged, and are, as were the Meridian disciples, to take the gospel to those of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. 29 verse 8, the phrase, the testimony of two nations, meant many murmur because they receive more of God's word. In the justice of God, none are to be condemned for failure to accept revealed truth when the reality of the revelation is not clearly established. The truth of salvation do, do not stand alone. This principle, though well, not, well known to ancient Israel, is never mentioned in the theologies of modern Christendom. Yet it was by virtue of this principle that John the Baptist was called to prepare the way for Christ, and that both John and Christ were required to seal their testimony with their blood. In lack minor, it was the principle that required that Hiram Smith be in cartridge to mingle his blood with that of the prophet Joseph. The same principle required that two others be with them, John Taylor and Willow Richards, and that both survived so they may have an impeachable account of the martyrdom. It was for this reason that Joseph Smith was never alone when priesthood or keys were restored and that missionaries were sent out two by two. The phrase, I speak the same words unto one nation like unto another, referred to. Our Lord has put, uh, the Lord has put one plan for, has but one plan of salvation for his children, and that plan remains the same throughout all generations of time. To know the gospel in one age is to know the gospel in all ages. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. That was true in Adam's day, Noah's day, Abraham's day. Joseph Smith's day today. The phrase, when two nations shall run together, refers to, in speaking, of, in speaking to Nephi of two nations, the Lord may well have in mind the tribal nations of ancient days, of nations of ancient days and the seed of Nephi. The great thrust of the Old Testament record is the eventual reunion of Judah and Ephraim. Just as the descendants of these ancient sons of Jacob will be reunited, so shall their scriptural records grow together with the scriptural records of the fruit of the loins of Nephi. So you'll have the scriptural records of the Nephites and the scriptural records of the Jews, the Bible and the Book of Mormons coming together, nations running together. 29 verse 9, the phrase that I may prove unto many meant, it is sometimes suggested that spiritual things are not to be proven, indeed cannot be. Scriptural texts state otherwise. Malachi challenged us to prove the Lord by the payment of tithes, promising that he would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Christ extended his promise to embrace all gospel principles, including the manifestation through the Spirit that he was indeed the Son of God. Illustrating the pattern by which gospel truth is to be taught, Nephi cited Isaiah's testimony of Christ and then added to it his own testimony and that of his brother Jacob. The testimony of Isaiah and Jacob, he said, would serve to prove his words. Wherefore, by the words of three, he reasoned, quoting a scriptural text whose origin is now lost to us, God has said, I will establish my word. In so doing, Nephi unites Nephi united testimonies of the old and new worlds and testimonies of past and present, such being the system by which God proveth all his words. The phrase, the same yesterday, today, and forever means the whole system of salvation depends upon the consistency of God. Were it not for the knowledge that God's perfection is not of recent origin or something which he must yet obtain, we could hardly be expect to value that which he spoke anciently or not wonder about the possibility of his changing his mind about what he asks of us at present. That's why he's the same yesterday and forever. If God was still learning, I could not have faith in that. He may learn something we should have done. 
and then all is lost. The phrase, my work is not yet finished, referred to, as one earth shall pass away, the Lord told Moses, and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come, and there is no end to my work, neither to my words. Thus, President Russell M. Nell stated, we're, witnessing, we're witnesses to a process of restoration. If you think the church has been fully restored, you've just seen the beginning. There is much more to come. Wait until next year, and then the next year. Eat your vitamin pills. Get your rest. It's going to be exciting. End of quote. Chapter 29, verse 10. You need not suppose it contains all my words. Means among the worst of sectarian heresies is the idea that the Bible contains all the word of God. Concluding his gospel, John wrote, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, and which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that, that even the whole the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Whether John made reference to the breadth and volume of Jesus' deeds and teachings or to the sacred nature of them, the conclusion is the same. The Word of God cannot be confined to books, let alone to a single book. That would be absurdity. God would not be God if he is limited. 29 verses 11 through 14, the phrase, I command all men that they shall write, means if one people to whom Christ speak is required to write some portion of his words, then it follows as the night follows the day, that a like command will be given to all to whom he speaks. This in order that the testimonies of all nations and men of all ages might unite to bless those who will hear and to leave without excuse. Those who will not hear, verse 11. In view of this statement and the following in verse 12, and I shall also speak to all the nations of the earth, and they shall write it. The utter indifference to all sacred literature except the Bible is rather unfortunate. As Latter-day Saints, we ex have accepted the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Spice as inspired guides to eternal life. But we also acknowledge our obligation to accept truth from whatever source it comes. In any age... And all ages, the Lord's people, let me say it again, in all ages, the Lord's people have had scriptures of their own writing. The Nephites kept their own scripture records have, as have all the scattered branches of the house of Israel, which were led away by the Lord. It appears that other families like that of Lehi and Ishmael were led from time to time by the hand of the Lord to various places throughout the earth. They would have kept spiritual records, which will someday be restored to us. In this passage, the Lord announces a future day when he will speak unto all nations of the earth, and they also will write it. Of a surety, as long as there are righteous people on the earth, new scriptural records will be written. Verse 12. All the sacred writings will someday be gathered together. Verse 13. The gathering and restoration of Israel in the last days also embrace a gathering and restoration of scriptural records from all her scattered remnants, along with the gathering to the lands of their possession. These will come to the church to obtain the records of their fathers, as the Lamanites are now doing. Both the Book of Mormon Bible were written to the scattered tribes of Israel, all of whom will be gathered on the same terms and conditions. Verse 14. Elder Neil A. Maxwell testified that other records yet to come forth will testify of Jesus Christ. Quote, Lost books are among the treasures yet to come forth. Over 20 of these are mentioned in existing scriptures. Perhaps most startling, the voluminous, startling of volumin, voluminous will be the records of the lost tribes of Israel. We would not even know of the impending third witness of Christ except through the precious Book of Mormon, the second witness of Christ. The third set of records will thus complete a, tri complete a triad of truth. Then, just as the perfect shepherd has said, my word shall also be gathered in one. There will be one fold and one shepherd in welding together all of the Christian dispensations of human history. End of quote. Chapter 30 of Second Nephi. Chapter 30, verses 1 through 2. Would not suffer that ye should suppose that ye are more righteous than the Gentiles shall be. That phrase means Jews and Gentiles are on a level of equality before God. For Gentiles who repent thereby join the covenant people and share its privileges and prerogatives, as well as its duties and responsibilities. On the other hand, Jews who will not repent are cast off. 
St. Paul teaches the same doctrine when he said, or the promises that he made Abraham should be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, the gospel. Again, there is no difference between Jew and Greek, Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Chapter 30, verse 1, the phrase, Except ye shall keep the commandments of God, ye shall perish. There is no salvation in sin. Christ came to save men from their sins, not in them. It is an eternal verity that no unclean, unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God. To those of our dispensation, the Lord has said, All who have, will have a blessing at my hand shall abide the law, which was appointed for that blessing, and the conditions thereof, as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. Thus there are no covenants that are of efficacy, virtue, or force that have not been sustained by righteousness. Chapter 30, verse 2, the phrase, As many as Gentiles as will repent are the covenant people of the Lord. In all dispensations, the Lord's people have been a covenant people and have understood that without righteousness, their covenants are null and void. Thus the Lord promised a land to Abraham and his descendants, saying that it was to be their everlasting possession when they hearkened to my voice. Only an obedient people, a people recognizing Christ as their Savior, can lay claim to that covenant. Never are such promises granted to men in wickedness. If the descendants of Abraham rejected Christ, they also reject the covenants that Christ made with their ancient father and no longer have claim upon them. If, on the other hand, those not of the lineage of Abraham repent and accept Christ, they become his covenant people and thus rightful heirs to all the promises made to Abraham the father to the faithful. They will be adopted into the house of Abraham, into the house of Israel. Of this principle, Joseph Smith said, The time has at last arrived when the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has set his hand again the second time to recover the remnants of his people, which have been left from, have been left from Assyria and from Egypt, and from Prathros, and from Cush, from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the isles of the sea, and with them to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles, and establish that covenant with them, which was promised when their sin should be taken away. This covenant has never been established with the house of Israel, nor with the house of Judah, for it requires two parties to make a covenant, and those two parties must be agreed, or no covenant can be made. This covenant to which the prophet referred is made in the waters of baptism, that being the ordinance ordained by God whereby sins are remitted, and we first take upon ourselves the name of Christ. So the Jews that are gathering over in Jerusalem right now are of the house of Jacob, but they're not of the house of Israel because they have not entered into the covenant name. They can't get the covenant name because they haven't entered into the covenant through baptism. That is still yet to be. Chapter 30, verses 3 through 6. Verse 3, as the resurrection was the tangible evidence that Jesus was the Christ for the living in the meridian of time, so the Book of Mormon is the tangible evidence for the fullness of the restoration of the gospel in this dispensation. It is our greatest missionary tool. Here, verses 4 through 5, Nephi notes that from it the descendants of Lehi will learn of their fathers, and that their fathers, contrary to the concepts of Christian churches generally, knew and worshipped Christ. Indeed, it is in the Book of Mormon that we have restored to us a knowledge of the most basic fundamental principles of the gospel, principles lost to the Bible as we presently have it. The Book of Mormon, not the Bible, teaches that there is a plan of salvation, that Christ is literally and unequivocally the Son of God, that it was necessary for Adam to fall in order that we be born, that without the atonement we would all become angels to the devil, and on through a host of doctrines fundamental to the exercise of faith and to the attaining of salvation. Verse 6, the seed of Lehi will rejoice in the restoration of such truths, which will free them from the darkness of false traditions and the bondage of ignorance from which they have long wandered. Nephi graphically says the scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, thus emphasizing that for both people and nations, the working up of salvation is a process rather than of an event. And in the course of generations, he said, they shall become a pure and delightsome people. 
30 verse 4, the phrase, the remnant of our seed are descendants of the Jews. The idea that the Lamanites are remnants of the Jews is affirmed in a revelation given to Joseph Smith. 6, 1927, the expression, however, has referenced the fact that their forefathers were citizens of Manasseh of Judah, not that they were of, the, of that tribe. Lehi was a descendant of Manasseh, Ishmael of Ephraim. The Book of Mormon is the record of Joseph. So Nephi says that he's a Jew, not meaning he's from the tribe of Judah, but meaning he came from the area of Judea. 30 verse 6, a phrase appearing on delightsome people meant, in early editions of the Book of Mormon, this phrase read, a white and delightsome people. The manuscript of the prophet prepared for 1840 edition was changed to pure rather than from white. In the theological sense, the difference is slight, white being the symbol of purity. This, however, is not intended to say that in the course of generations, righteous and faithful Lamanites will not lose their darker skin, for such the Book of Mormon repeatedly prophesies. Chapter 30, verse 7, the phrase, Jews shall begin to believe in Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie discussed the, prophes discussed the prophesied conversion of the Jews following the second coming of Christ. Quote, and it shall come to pass that the Jews which are scattered also shall begin to believe in Christ, and they shall begin to gather in upon the face of the land. Much of the old Jewish bitterness against Christ has ceased. Now, many now accept him as a great rabbi, though not the son of God. A few have accepted him in the full sense, coming into the true church, along with the gathered remnants of Ephraim and his fellows. But the greatest conversion of the Jews, their return to the truth as a nation, is destined to follow the second coming of their Messiah. Those able to abide that day in their extremity and mourning will ask, What are the wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? Then shall they know that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. Thus Nephi writes of a time when the Jews which are scattered will also begin to believe in Christ. As with his prophecy describing the conversion of the Lamanites, again he emphasizes a process rather than event. History knows no people who have more tightly bound themselves with false tradition than the Jews. It appears from Latter-day Revelation that the great conversion among the Jews will not take place until after Christ has set his foot upon the Mount of Olives and has been split in two. At that time, the Jews will look upon the Lord and ask, What are the wounds in thy hands and in thy feet? Then shall they know that I am the Lord, for I was saying to them, These wounds are the wounds which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. Then shall they lament because of their persecuted their king. So it won't be till Christ coming will we see great numbers of the Jews enter into the church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. Chapter 30, verse 8, the phrase, The Lord shall commence his work, meaning, The work of Galilee will commence in the millennium will be of such a magnitude that the extent of the gathering previously will hardly constitute a beginning in comparison. So the major gathering of Israel will take during the millennium. That's when we will see a great marvelous work and a wonder. And we will no longer speak of the miracles done by Moses dividing the Red Sea. We will see the miracle of this huge gathering that will overshadow all else. That's in Jeremiah 16, 16, 14 through 16. Christ personally ministered in the land of Palestine among the Nephites in the world, among other remnants of the lost tribes. Each had his church, his priests, and his doctrines. Notwithstanding this, the prophecies foretold a universal apostasy to be followed by a universal restoration. Texts like the present one, which prophesy of restoration when the gospel will go to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, also stand as an evidence of the universal apostasy. Because of the Lord's promise that when the ten tribes return, their prophets will lead them, some have supposed that they were not part of the apostasy. If both the apostasy and the restoration are to be universal, as so many of our prophets have testified, then this could hardly be the case. The prophets who led the lost tribes in their return, the priesthood, lead, leaders among them, will be called and ordained by that prophet holding the keys of the gathering in Israel and the leading of the ten tribes in the land of the north. The Lord's house has ever been house of order. And the only person that holds those keys right now is Prophet Nelson. 
that's who those prophets would have to come from. He would call them to lead the ten tribes back. 29 verse 30 verse chapter 30 verse 9 in the phrase judge the poor a feast of fat things meaning a feast of the blessings of the gospel in the house of the lord has been promised to the poor each person nation is to hear the gospel either mortality or in the spirit world in the providence of god it will first go to those nations of wealth and education those nations whose faithful sons and daughters can then reach out to take the fullness of the blessings to the poor the lame the blind the deaf meaning the underprivileged nations, that all might come to the marriage feast of the Lamb. The phrase, reprove with equity for the meek, means God, who shows no favoritism to those of worldly wealth and position, has promised that the poor and the meek will have the gospel preached unto them, and they shall inherit the earth in its sanctified and perfected state. In the context of this prophecy, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, Isaiah wrote, the meek shall also increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among them shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. The phrase, the rod of his mouth, meant the metaphor is a strong one, the rod being a symbol of both authority and chastisement. Also, we learn from Lehi's dream that the rod of iron represents the word of God. So perhaps the rod of his mouth may have reference to that Christ will also use the word of God to smite the earth and condemn his, the wicked. Uh, should be condemned the wicked B the phrase breath of his lips means by the command of God through Jesus Christ who is the word of his power the wicked shall be destroyed by the brightness of the glory of the second coming God has no need of armies or armaments to carry out his decrees Chapter 30, verse 10, a great division among the people, that phrase meant, eventually all must choose. All must either accept the Christ testified of in the Book of Mormon or reject him. There is no other Christ. And where Christ is concerned, there is no middle ground. Those rejecting the testimony of the Book of Mormon prophets will be cut off from among the Lord's people at the Lord's return. And until that hour, there will be foolish virgins among the wise. And at that hour, cometh an entire separation of the righteous and the wicked. And in that day will I send mine angels to pluck out the wicked and cast them into the unquestionable fire. You can tell a true Christian who truly believes and knows who Christ is because when they are taught about the Book of Mormon, they will accept it. Chapter 30, verse 11, Girdle. The, or the Orientals, when walking fast or working, found it convenient to gather up their long flowing robes by means of a girdle. They would tuck in their robes in this girdle so they wouldn't get in the way of their feet during work. During the millennium, it seems the Lord will take part in the activities of his people. But righteous and faithfulness, not militarism, militarism and hypocrisy will be his strength, the force of his reins, his girdle. Loins means were supposed to be the seat of strength. To gird up the loins was in pathetic parlance to make ready for work or for traveling untrammeled. Reins is the same as kidneys, supposed to be the symbol of a desire, also of knowledge, joy, pleasure, sometimes coupled with the heart. Thus, the righteousness Thus, righteousness will enable Christ to do his work, girdle, in strength, his loins, while faithfulness will direct his desires, reigns, as he does his work, his girdle. So that's what that phrase means. Chapter 30, verse 12, wolf, leopard, lion, lamb, kid, and calf. Six animals are listed, not counting the fatling. Three are wild carnivores, wolf, leopard, and lion, that feed on the time, three tame animals, lamb, kid, and calf. The wild animals, which are ferocious, aggressive, and vicious, are a threat to mankind. The tame animals are docile, submissive, and useful to man. This passage may be taken literally, or the wolf, the lion, and the lamb may represent those who ferment war and murder. The lamb, kid, and calf may symbolize meek and peaceful people. Predator and prey conditions will no longer exist during the millennium, is what this could mean. Fatling means the King James Version translation of fatling is probably incorrect. The Jerusalem Bible suggests calf and lion cub feed together, replacing fatling with the verb feed. 
The phrase little children shall lead them means small children will not only feel safe among the ferocious beasts, but will have control over them and lead them. What a paradisiacal state that surely will be. Chapter 30, verse 13, cow, bear, lion, and ox. Isaiah continues to compare wild carnivorous animals, bear and lion, with tame animals, cow and ox. His prophecy that the lion will pasture like the ox suggests that there will be no shedding of blood during the millennium by man or beast. During the millennium, the enmity of man and the enmity of beast, yea, the enmity of all flesh shall cease from before my face, he said in Doctrine and Covenants 101. The phrase, their young ones, this refers to the offspring of the cow and the bear and indicates that subsequent generation of beasts will have no hostility towards one another. Their peaceful state of affairs, wherein no blood is shed, will endure. Chapter 3, verse 14, sucking child, wean child, the asp and the cockatrice. This phrase means both the nursing infant and the winged toddler are completely helpless in the face of danger, but during the millennium, both will be able to play at the asp, possibly meaning the cobra, and the cockatrice, possibly meaning the viper. Zden, for poisonous snakes that once harmed and destroyed, will be harmless. The curse between the seed of the woman, the child, and the serpent will be gone. The serpent here calls... The serpent here called to mind that old serpent called the devil and Satan, whose intent it is to harm and destroy the souls of men. Satan, however, will be bound during the millennium with all of his angels so that peaceful conditions can hold sway. Chapter 30, verse 15. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Means enmity will be removed from the earth, and peace and love and kindness will be the rule. Holy Mountain may refer to the entire earth in its temple like condition. The phrase earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord refers to. Joseph Smith quoted this statement, but he added that it will be sacred knowledge that will fill them, the earth. Nephi, after quoting Isaiah's statement that the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, explained that the things of all nations shall be made known. Yea, all things shall be made known unto the children of men. There is nothing which is secret, save it shall be revealed. There is no work of darkness, save it shall be made manifest in light. And there is nothing which is sealed upon the earth, save it shall be loosed. Wherefore, all things which have been revealed unto the children of men shall at that day be revealed. Boy, what an interesting and glorious time that will be. The phrase, as the waters cover the sea, refers to the sacred knowledge of God and his gospel will be as extensive as the waters that cover much of the earth's surface. Elder Dallin H. Oaks taught that the outpouring of knowledge from heaven includes a knowledge of God's ways, an increase in the presence of the Holy Ghost, and an understanding of the doctrine of the priesthood. Quote, In our day we are experiencing an explosion of knowledge around the world and its people, but the people of the world are not experiencing a comparable expansion of knowledge about God and his plan for his children. On that subject, what the world needs is not more scholarship and technology, but more righteousness and revelation. I long for the day prophesied by Isaiah when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. In inspired utterance, the prophet Joseph Smith described the Lord's pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. This will not happen for those whose hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. Those who fail to learn and use the principles of righteousness will be left to kick will be left to themselves to kick against those in authority to pursue the saints and to fight against God. In contrast, the Lord makes this great promise to the faithful the doctrine of the priesthood shall dispel, dispel upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion, and thy scepter an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, and thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. End of his quote. What great blessings that are promised to the faithful. Chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, the Lord's revelation declared as the preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, the revelation known to us as the voice of warning. The Lord said, The rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow, for their iniquity shall be spoken on the housetops, and their secret acts shall be revealed. These verses apply, appear to apply to the millennium when all things be made known, even the works of darkness inspired by Satan, who will no more have power who will have no more power over the hearts of men. 
Thank you for watching. Hopefully that helped you with these chapters in the Book of Mormon and these great promises that are made to the faithful. May we stay faithful. May we, even if we don't completely understand faithful to God's doctrine, His teachings, His ways, and submit to His will and to denounce the false ideologies and philosophies that are so prevalent in the world today. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.